right, I'm excited to be here. I had planned to do this last year for Women's History Month, but instead I got cataracts, so I felt like I needed to be able to see to do that. So here we are. Um, I wanted to start out today by talking about where women were, and actually I think we skipped, nope, okay. Um, where women were in about 1900, because you need to understand this to know and to, to get why um, birth control was such an issue at this time. So in 1900, 19% of women worked for pay, and 60% of those that worked were servants. So not very many people working, but definitely you're starting to see many more women working um, outside the home. Um, at the same time, you're seeing 19% of college degrees awarded to women. That number kind of surprised me. It seems like when we, when we think about the past, 1900, it seems like it was still all men. But about 90% of the degrees were awarded to women. Women still could not vote, 1900. Could not vote. They could vote in some state elections, but not in anything national. Um, the birth rate had dropped in um, the 100 years between 1800 to 1900. The birth rate, birth rate dropped pretty significantly. So obviously there were some shifts there. Um, continuing along, let's look about, let's look at birth control before Comstock. Before the Comstock Act, which is the big thing we'll talk about today, there obviously was birth control. We saw the birth rate drop by half in 100 years. Also, there's been birth control ever since there's been birth. You know, that's just the way it's been. So the very oldest known um, birth control document was 1850 BC. Um, I can't read it. You probably can't either. But that was the oldest one ever produced. Um, the first real birth control document published in the United States was published in 1832. And one other thing that I'm going to do for you today is I'm going to introduce you to Google Books. Google Books is my best friend. Google Books um, allowed me to do my, almost my entire thesis laying in my bed with a bag of dark chocolate M&Ms um, because Google Books has millions of books that are digitized and available right there and particularly old books, which were the books that I really needed. Um, so that saved me enormous amounts of time. Also, it does all the searching for you. It will, it will make it very easy for you to find any source information that you need. So this is a copy. It's not the original 1832 version. Um, it was published a few years later. But this is a copy of Fruits of Philosophy. And if this is something that you're interested in looking at, um, certainly you can go pull it up yourself later. Um, I believe we published a copy of my bibliography. Did you? Yeah, we're going to put that along with the video. Oh, OK. So that'll be available online. Um, but you can see some of the information in here when we get to it. Come on, come on, come on. Um, it's pretty explicit and pretty detailed. Back in this time frame, um, women were using um, suppositories. They were using. Um, they were, um, obviously there was, you know, the, the standard abstinence and all that stuff. But there was a lot, there was a lot of information that surprised me. Originally, I, I really didn't expect that women knew too much about what was, what was going on with their own bodies. But they knew at this point. Um, there's detailed diagrams and all that good stuff in there. Um, one other little tidbit I always like to think about, because this, this messes with my head. Back in the Egyptian days, one of the methods of birth control they used was a suppository that contained crocodile dung. Now, the reason why that messes with my head is I think, who would have decided crocodile dung would be good for that? And how many times did you have to use it before you knew it was effective? Like, that just boggles my mind. I like thinking about stuff like that. Um, well, they said it was. I mean, I obviously did not do any research myself, but they felt like it was a very effective. Well, not in Egypt. <laughs> in Crystal Lake, probably. But in Egypt, it was not so bad. Um, in 1839, you started to see vulcanized rubber and condoms started to um, become more available. Before that, the condoms were made out of sheep's intestines and things like that, not so much. Um, but condoms back in the 18 um, and 19th century, condoms were really for prostitutes. You used a condom when you were with a prostitute. You did not use a condom with your wife. So if you did not want your wife to get pregnant, that was not, that was, that was horrible. That would be like inferring that your wife was, was a prostitute. So that just did not happen back in that day. 
Um, in the same period, you saw things like um, boarding houses and, and the sporting life. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the sporting life, but um, back in the, the 1830s, 1840s, um, this was, this was a time where people stopped being so agriculturally based and started moving to cities, particularly young men. And when young men move to the cities, they do what young men tend to do. And they gambled, they drank, and they ran around with loose women. And that was what the sporting life was all about. So men were encouraged to get out there and sow their wild oats. Women, on the other hand, not so much. Women were supposed to stay pure and clean and, and shouldn't have even known that boarding houses existed or things that happened during that time. Um, during the Civil War, this is, the Civil War is when um, some of the censorship that we saw through the Comstock Act started to kick in. In the Civil War, um, there were pictures called Barracks Favorites, and these were very tame by our standards nowadays. You could probably see more if you ever saw a Miley Cyrus video. But at that time, pretty shocking um, pictures of women. And men would have those during the war as things to look at. And that horrified a lot of people. Um, and the way the politicians wanted to try to control that was through the mail. Because back then, everything happened through the mail. So if you could control the mail, you could control access to some of these things. These, there were, so there were some restrictive laws passed during this time frame. But you started to see as this century moved on, more and more restrictions. Um, the other thing that I found very interesting in this time is the role of the YMCA, particularly the YMCA of New York, was very focused on keeping children and women safe from the dangers of pornography and, and you know birth control and all this kind of stuff. So um, the, the YMCA of New York was backed by a lot of the wealthy people of the time, the wealthy barons and, and scions and all that. And they created a subgroup called the NYSSV, which I just like to imagine they had capes and all that because it just seems like it needs one of those things. So the NYSSV was the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. And back here on Google Books, you can actually pull up some of their, um, some of their annual reports which is great because their annual report tells you an awful lot about what they're doing. Basically, what they did is they tried to prevent people from getting information on all kinds of things. Um, we will probably talk more about this maybe in the fall workshop day because apparently I get to come back and talk again. Um, but one of the things they found most interesting about the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice is and I know it's not shocking, but there was a lot of hypocrisy going on. Um, Samuel Colgate was one of the founding members, um, you know, Colgate Toothpaste. He also, um, his company also sold Vaseline. And back then, Vaseline was a spermicide. And it was sold saying it was a spermicide. But at the same time, he's trying to restrict people's access to information. Um, so I, it was just kind of interesting. It's okay if we're earning money, but not, not for other people. Um, so continuing along. Yes. Oh, oh, yes, that. That was another. Christine, you probably know a little bit about that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> what it is is um, back in that in that era, um, that was what they used to refer to as masturbation. That was the phrase, and it was a very, very taboo thing. You were never to. The seed was never to be spilled, and, and you know that was the time frame when cornflakes um, took prominence, and, and cornflakes originally were hoped to make people less interested in that sort of behavior. Um, you, you saw that push to, to kind of stay away from all of that, that, that any kind of contact that wasn't for procreation was to be discouraged, and that was, that was what that kind of talked about. So moving forward to the Comstock Act, 1873 is when this act was passed. And I love thinking about how this Comstock Act came to be because it's, it's such a fun story. Um, Anthony Comstock was the guy who promoted the act. Now, he was not elected to any position. He was not part of the federal government at all at this time. He was a guy who lived in New York 
who was appalled at some of the things that he saw out there in the real world. And he wanted to protect women and children from these things. Now, I will grant you, there, are, there were definitely some things going on that were very inappropriate. There, was, there were horrible pictures of, you know, bestiality and, and, you know, sex with children and horrible things like that. And, and, you know, so there were definitely some issues. But what ended up happening is with the passage of this law, everything got lumped together. So anything that Anthony Comstock decided was obscene was officially obscene. Um, that's a lot of power for one person to have. Um, and Anthony Comstock, again, not elected to any position. He actually went to Congress and lobbied people individually and collectively to get this law passed and had the law passed as the Comstock Act. So you can imagine somebody like Anthony Comstock who's very puritanical and he knows right and now the act is named after him, it's his act, um, and he ended up being able to go around the country and enforce his act um, all over the place and ended up becoming a postal inspector with 100% authority to enforce this particular law. So the law itself, um, is called an act for the suppression of trade in and circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use. Every obscene, lewd, lascivious, or filthy book, pamphlet, picture, paper, letter, writing, print, or other publication of an indecent character was viewed as unmailable. And this is the way that they got it. So you could produce something, you could not mail it. And back then, all distribution happened through the mail. That's just how things got, got spread around. So what this meant is even if you were a mom writing to your newly married daughter and wanted to share information about birth control, that was technically illegal. Now the odds that they would open up your letter and read that you would put something in there it was pretty slim. But this gave the government a lot of authority to censor, to control whatever they didn't like. Um, Included in this law, and this was not in the original drafts, this came up later, but tacked in near the end was how or by what means, oh, that's a space between my us there, what means con con um, conception may be prevented or abortion procedures, whether sealed or unsealed. So that was tacked on to the end that, that birth control was also included, that it was no longer just pornography and, and things like that, that now all of a sudden birth control information was was. Um, was involved. And again, remember, there had already been pamphlets produced for years, for decades, about birth control. In the 1930s, or 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, 60s, even early 1870s, people would send away for these pamphlets, you know, five cents and you get this information and very useful, very effective kind of information and stuff that is still actually effective today. I don't know that we would necessarily use some of the recipes. Um, a lot of them are, are natural products and, you know, I don't cook at all, so I'm certainly not going to cook up a batch of, you know, a suppository or anything like that. But um, they have been scientifically proved to be effective. Okay, here's a picture of Anthony Comstock. And he, to me, he's one of those guys, he's just, again, very puritanical, knows he's right no matter what, very full of himself. Um, he was proud of his record. He bragged all over the place about his record. 3,697 persons were arrested. 2,740 pled guilty or were convicted. He had fines of several hundreds of thousands of dollars, which back then was pretty good money. Um, he destroyed 160 tons of obscene literature. Now, he didn't just deal with birth control. He was looking at all kinds of information, art, music, um, everything. So some of the things that he, um, that he censored, he attempted to censor George Bernard Shaw's Mrs. Warren's profession um, and ended up being labeled, they, they started kind of mocking him by this point and instead of just Comstock, it was a Comstockery, like a mockery of, of decent and, and right ideas and, and openness to the arts. Um, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass was also another one of the things that he, yeah, I, exactly. Anything that was offensive. Now you do have to remember, back in this era, the role of women was very different than it is today. Very, very different. Back then, um, there was the, the cult of motherhood. Women were good women, and not all women qualified as good women. Um, good women didn't work. Good women were responsible for raising their children. 
They were responsible for instilling the virtues of decency in their family. That was really their only job. And this was a huge shift. Back 100 years prior, women worked on the farm. The, basically, everyone was, was rural. They worked on the farm with their husbands. They had much more defined roles. Um, it was much more clear what they should do. They also lived in communities. They lived with siblings and parents and grandparents. It was kind of more of a, a commune sort of an arrangement back in those days. And in the Victorian era, you start to see people moving towards um, living in cities and living alone, just one family living by themselves really changed the role of women quite dramatically. This is also the time frame where you start to see some of those labor saving devices. Now we look at them today and don't think they saved a lot of labor, but um, labor saving devices started to be created. That made the role of women much easier. In order to be a good woman though, you weren't allowed, to, you, you didn't work. So women who worked were immediately no, they were, they were not eligible to be good women. So if you were lower class, that, that was out. Um, you had to have a husband who was in a, a good and decent profession. And if you were one of these women, you were to be um, protected from anything negative. You, you didn't like sex, or at least you weren't supposed to. You were supposed to only tolerate it for the purpose of procreation. There are doctors on record. Um, I have in my thesis a few different places where some doctors said, you know, women don't like it, they never will, they just submit quietly, passively, tolerate. Um, so women weren't supposed to enjoy any of that. And their job was, was to soften men. And they were not supposed to know anything about politics or anything volatile. They were just to be quiet and protected. So they weren't supposed to worry about money. They weren't supposed to worry about you know, political issues or anything like that. It was just they were to be domestic in their homes maybe doing some social things, um, maybe doing some charity work, but that was really what was expected of women. And again, a very narrow focus, and not very many women qualified for that status, but that was the status to which all women aspired. Um, and because that left so much time in their schedule, you know, particularly the ones that had domestic servants, so if you have domestic servants and you don't read anything, at least not anything controversial, and you're not really working, what do you, that's why women were expected to raise children who were pure and good. And that was really their only focus, was raising pure and good children. So they had to really do that well, which is why children needed to be protected from any negative influences. Yes, you had a question? I'm sorry, what? Yes, no, you're right. Women, many women did work, but it was one of those things where to be, to be a lady, ladies didn't work. So it, it's one of those double standards that you'll, we see all the time. Um, so in order to be a genteel woman that everyone aspired to, you didn't work. But yes, you're right. Many women were nurses, domestic servants, um, teachers, all sorts of professions like that. And many of them had to work. You know, there were definitely times where in order to earn a living, you have to work. Now, unfortunately, that excluded you from being, you know, something aspired to. Did you have a, okay, yes. Um, I was, it, it just came to me, uh, so got a friend in Woodstock mm -hmm. who loves old documents. And I believe it was around this time period, he found a, a contract, a mm -hmm. teacher's contract, school, school teacher's contract. And, and part of that contract was she could not marry. Yeah. If, and keep her job. Mm -hmm. And so that just struck me. Uh, well, I agree. And actually, it's funny. My mother worked in um, the Chicago Public Schools before I was born, and they made her quit as soon as she showed. So that's, and I'm not that old. So, well, I'm <laughs> older than I used to be, but I'm not that old. Um, so the point being that there have been a lot of expectations and standards. Women were paid much less than men, even at, at, at that time, definitely, because, of course, they didn't have families or they wouldn't be working. And there were just a lot of those, those expectations um, in the Victorian era. It was kind of a rigidly defined time frame. And the main focus when it came to women, the focus of men, was, was to protect their wife from anything harmful. 
from anything negative, which included talk of sex. Now, if you've read um, Eric Larson's follow-up to Devil in the White City was the Everly Sisters, I think that was the name of the, tit the title of the book. It was all about the, the prostitution um, trade in Chicago around this time frame. Really interesting book um, because it talked about that dichotomy between the woman at home and the woman you paid and the, who they were and, and what you would expect from your wife versus a prostitute. Just kind of an interesting, interesting contrast. Um, this little cartoon here shows the, the women's sphere. Um, women were not, again, they were not expected to go outside the home. They were expected to stay really close in there. You could peek over the wall, but you couldn't really, couldn't really leave, shouldn't be involved in anything else like that. Um, Immigration was another factor during this time frame. And it's funny because, um, you know, we, immigration is an issue even in this time frame, but a completely different focus on immigration. Back then, immigration caused a lot of strife in people who were fearful of Eastern Europeans. So if you weren't fair with, with light colored skin and all that, you were scary and we didn't want to let you in. There was a lot of fear of that. Um, so immigration was a big thing. Teddy Roosevelt actually in 1905 went on record chastising women. Now women again were the you know the blonde, you, you know, the the fair skinned you know English Irish those kind of women chastising them for not having more children, and they called this race suicide. There was a huge fear that we were going as a country to be overrun by you know, Italians and, and, and people from that, the Slavic people. They were going to overrun the country and take us over, and they would not, we would no longer be the dominant race in the country. Now, isn't that funny? Because what comes around goes around. So just over 100 years ago, that fear was, was definitely prevalent. And again, women were, were pushed. You were selfish if you didn't have enough children to keep your race going forward. So... Um, the other element that was important at this time frame is people started to marry for love. It was no longer about marrying because it made sense financially, economically, or, you know, gosh, you're, you're, your father owns the farm next to my farm. If we get married, we've got more acreage. It wasn't, it wasn't a business arrangement anymore. It started to be, you started to see courting rituals. And that is another reason why women started end up, ended up being protected. You know, we were courting them. And when you court women, you, you know, you treat them like delicate flowers and all of that sort of stuff, as opposed to, you know, hey, my name's Bob. We should get married. This makes a lot of sense. Um, so all those factors kind of fit together. Um, there are really three people that I focus most of my research on. And I will tell you, I've spent the last year and a half debating, if I did a talk like this, what I would cover and how, because it's too much information to do in an hour. And even up until 11.45 today, I was still struggling in, in my head about how to split this up and make sure it made sense. Um, so the three people that we're mainly focusing on are Anthony Comstock, um, Margaret Sanger, and Mary Weir Dennett. Um, Margaret Sanger went on to become the founder of Planned Parenthood. She is credited as having coined the phrase birth control. Before it was called birth control, it was called family limitation, which is a little more polite. Um, she is credited with that. However, there's some um, research that says she didn't actually come up with the phrase. She just took credit for coming up with the phrase, which is kind of how Margaret Sanger did things. Um, great woman, just 5'2", ego of a seven foot tall person. Um, Margaret Sanger's mother died very early. She died of tuberculosis. Margaret Sanger's mother had 14 kids. Yeah. So obviously, Margaret felt like her mother was worn down by having all these children and that had there just been birth control information available, she wouldn't have died. Um, so because of that, Margaret kind of came into things feeling a little bit frustrated about, about birth control specifically. But that was really not her focus early on. Um, she did go to nursing school. She didn't complete her degree, but she did go to nursing school for a while. Um, soon after that, she was on the Lower East Side of, of New York helping women um, kind of as a, a sort of a pseudo midwife. And one of the women, as the story goes, and there's some contention about whether this is a true story or something else that was fabricated. But as the story goes, she was called to um, help out a woman called Sadie Sachs. Sadie Sachs was pregnant with her 15th child initially. And um, 
was having a lot of complications. So Margaret Sanger helped her through, de through the delivery. Um, afterwards, the doctor told Sadie not to have any more children. And when Sadie asked, how do I not have, like, how can I prevent this? Because again, there's no information anymore. There used to be information, but now it's, it's all cut off. Um, and there were uh, many people during this time who stopped understanding the biology of the female reproductive cycle and started assuming that women were like animals. And when you went into heat, that was where the trouble was. So again, 16 children later, um, you realize maybe that's not the case. So Sadie Sachs was told not to have any more children. The doctor refused to give her any more information than that. Figure it out. Just don't have any more. Let your husband sleep on the roof. That was literally what she was told according to the story. Have your husband sleep on the roof, which as you can imagine, probably not so popular an idea, especially for Mr. Sachs. So not too long later, Sadie is pregnant with number 16 and um, many more complications and she ends up dying as a result of this. So Margaret Sanger writes about this later and talks about how the, the sorrows is as deep as the skies and, and feels like she wants to do something to help the condition of women. Um, again, initially she wasn't so focused just on birth control. There were a lot of areas where women needed help and protection, a lot of areas where, where women didn't have the rights that we take for granted today. So it wasn't really about birth control yet, but she definitely wanted to see some changes. Um, the other woman I want to talk about, and then we'll talk a little more about their stories, but just to, to give you the lay of the land. Um, the other woman I wanted to talk about was Mary Weir Dennett. And actually, what's cool about her, I have two of the books that she wrote in 1924 and 1930, and one of them is even autographed, which is cool. So it's amazing what you can do nowadays with, with Amazon. Um, Mary Weir Dennett, her father died at the age of 10, obviously not birth related with the dad. Uh, but he died at the age of 10, which gave her a difficult childhood as well, but in some different ways. Um, she, she, we have some affinity with her here, most of us who are faculty. Um, she graduated from um, the School of Art and Design at Boston Museum of Fine Arts. She taught at Drexel University. Um, she ended up having three very difficult pregnancies. One was a stillborn. She was also told not to have any more children. Good luck with that. They didn't give her any details on how to not have more children. They just told her not to have any more. So um, she did what she knew to do, which was abstinence. And um, what ended up happening, and this is one of those sort of truer than fiction kind of stories that you'd, you'd see on Grey's Anatomy or Melrose Place or one of those kind of shows. But anyway, she had a best friend. They, her and her husband and this other couple, they were all best friends. Well, soon enough, Mrs. Chase became closer to her husband than to her. And the two of them started having an affair in her house while she lived there, and so on and so forth, eventually left her. And this was back in the time where if your husband left you, you really didn't have child support. There weren't any mechanisms to, to get support. So she ended up in a place where she had to work. So she worked for a couple different kinds of causes. She worked for, for women's suffrage, for free speech, anti-war kind of causes. That's initially where she focused her time and energies. And these were paid positions, which was really obviously good for her because she needed that. So moving forward, Margaret Sanger. Um, in 1912, she started publishing a magazine. It was an eight-page periodical, like a lot of people did back in this day. That was really how information was, was disseminated. Her, um, her publication was called The Woman Rebel. Um, the way she came to do this is, first of all, she was part of the Socialist Party. Um, she spoke on women's health and um, other topics like that because of her nursing background. She didn't graduate, but again, back then, not everyone did, and that was okay. It wasn't, you know, she didn't get in any trouble for any of that. Um, so that led her to write an article or a column for The Call. The Call was a socialist newspaper. The articles that she wrote were under the column, What Every Girl Should Know. And then from there, she wrote What Every Woman Should Know. And that really wasn't about birth control yet, but kind of moving along that path. Well, what ended up happening is it ended up being labeled obscene by the post office. And you can see the follow-up to the first column that she wrote. Um, this is what they published in the space, is What Every Girl Should Know, Nothing, by order of the post office department, February 9, 1913. So, 
it was banned. That's, that's what she came up with to kind of counteract that. Um, from there, she started publishing The Woman Rebel. At New York University has got an actual, um, they've got a huge collection of Margaret Sanger information, um, including all of the Woman Rebel um, editions. You can see in here, um, I'm going to go to, let's see, I think page eight is the good page. She is, she's an, oh, here it is, the prevention of contraception. This is what got the woman rebel banned. Now, the funny thing is, she's not actually giving any specific information. She's just talking about how wouldn't it be nice. And wouldn't it be nice, censored. That was all it took. Um, now, I will grant you, Margaret Sanger was not a quiet person. She was not the kind of person who was just going to go away. Um, and she was not the kind of person who would, who would try to tiptoe around anything. She was one of those who got in people's faces and really pushed to see, see, see things change. Um, the quote that she... Um, that she gave about the woman rebel and what it was about. She said it was a scathing denunciation of all organized conventionalities. It went as far as necessary to arouse, to arouse Comstockians to bite. And that's really what it was all about. She was on purpose trying to agitate and make people angry. It was not specifically about birth control. She was making people angry about everything, about women's rights, about immigrants, about um, unionization and socialism and all that kind of stuff. She was one of those people initially who just had, she had a lot of things she wanted to talk about. Um, eventually, it kind of moved into birth control. But before that, um, the first edition of Woman Rebel is unmailable. The second edition, she spent most of that second edition trying to bait postal inspectors, trying to get them to you know, get upset with her and do something about it. The third edition is unmailable. Um, there was an article on the dangers of abortion now, this is ironic because it was not, the article was saying abortion is bad. We should not have abortion. And if we just gave women information, they wouldn't have abortions. The abortion rate um, back in this time frame was actually a lot higher than we think it was. I've got, um, I brought a stack of books just in case. Um, but this book um, by Janet Brody does a really good job of talking about how frequently people had abortions in that time frame and who they were and why. And it's kind of, if you listen to the stories back before Roe v. Wade in the 60s about the backroom abortions, it's kind of like that except even less regulated because there weren't a lot of doctors performing them. So they ended up being just whoever you could convince to try to do something to help you with that. Um, so she was indicted August 25th. For the, May, for the March, May, and July editions, um, while she was waiting for trial, she wrote a pamphlet, a 16-page pamphlet called Family Limitation. Now, what's funny about Family Limitation is, I don't know, the English people in the room would have to kind of think about whether this was plagiarism or not. Most of the information in there was kind of that fruits of philosophy stuff. It was the same information, nothing really groundbreaking or new. Um, but she put it together in the 16-page pamphlet to try to give people the information she felt like they needed on birth control. Um, she decided to represent herself in the trial um, because that was going to arouse more publicity. And she was definitely the, the Kim Kardashian of her era, really big on, on publicity. And interestingly enough, my thesis, um, for my thesis, was um, dealing with the fact that these women used the law to have people stop enforcing the law because it became, huh, it became embarrassing for the government to keep enforcing the law because they looked ridiculous doing it. So the more that they enforced the law against birth control, the less effective it became and the more people found out about it. It's almost like in the act of saying, no, no don't think about what's, what's under this table. Don't think about it at all. You know what happens. What's under there? I got to find out. Um, so people started learning more things about it. Um, Margaret Sanger requested several delays, over and over again requested delays. When that, when she realized it was really going to happen, she was going to court, she jumped bail. She fled to Canada and then to Europe. She bailed, um, which is interesting. That piece of, of her behavior seems a little 
surprising given what we know about her being so confrontational, but it was kind of scary back in that day to be, you know, particularly a young woman, um, you know, to be in court. Um, so, oh, is this gonna, is this really how it's gonna go? This is gonna go that way, okay. Um, I had a little challenge this morning when I was, um, when I was saving my file, and clearly I saved the wrong one, but that's okay, because we don't need it. Um, so we'll turn this off, hopefully. Or not. Really? It's going to be one of those days. Okay, we'll just pretend like that's an amazing screen there. So Margaret Sanger was gone. She was overseas, and while she was overseas, she found out a lot of information about um, birth control clinics, what they did in Holland and other places like that. She also found out about pessiaries, and I'm sure you don't know what that is, but you probably do through its other or, uh, diaphragms. Um, that was the prevailing method used um, by women in this time frame in Europe. So she started to bring that, that technology back to the States. Um, she was gone for almost a year. During the time that she was gone, Mary Weir Dennett had also been involved in birth control and some of that, and she created the very first Birth Control Association. Um, again, Margaret Sanger was not here. So the National Birth Control League is created while well, she's out of, out of the country. Margaret Sanger comes back, and according to her, she gets off the boat and happens to run across a, a publication, like, you know, according to her, like two steps later. Um, but she finds this publication that's all about birth control and this whole national organization that's sprouted up in her absence. Now, she was, she was pissed. She was really, really pissed about this because she was under indictment for talking about it and she went overseas and this was her thing. She went overseas and she comes back and somebody else is already, like they've totally gone with it. And not only that, but they, they used her mailing risk list for the woman rebel. So they, they used her names and they're, they're doing it and she's not part of it, but yet she feels like it's her. So her and Mary Ware done it for the rest of their lives. And it's fun because they fought each other in that really nice 1920s, you know, elegant letters on the stationary fighting way, um, which was really cute. The, the um, actual letters, many of them are available through New York University's website. And you can see back and forth, my dear, my dear Mary, you know, while I appreciate, it's, it's like, it's that saccharine, but it's, it's very, it's, 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 I hate your guts, but I'm not going to say it that way. I'm going to say just how wonderful you are, but the undertone is. <laughs> um, anyway, so Margaret Sanger comes back. The, um, the organization has kind of gone a different way. She's a little lost, not quite sure what she wants to do. So what she ends up deciding to do is to open up the, the first birth control clinic in the United States. Um, there were many of them in Holland that she visited while she was there, so she decides to do that. It was called the Brownsville Clinic. Um, now again, being who she is, before she opened the clinic, she sent a press release to the New York Times letting them know. She advised the police department that while it's illegal, I'm doing it anyway. She had pamphlets in four or five different languages blanketing the community in which she was going to open this clinic in, in um, Brooklyn, New York. So she did all these things to make sure that it was known that this was coming, which of course meant that it was a huge shock when 10 days later they were all arrested. Um, so the way it went is in the first 10 days of operation, they saw over 500 people. 500 women were there. It was packed. Um, everybody wanted this information, particularly when you think about poor immigrant women who didn't have access to birth control information and are now having children at the rate of one a year. Now imagine, I mean, having children over and over and over again makes you more poor because they cost money and you can't work because now you've got, you know, 10 children at home, so you can't get a job to support your family, and now you're having more and more kids. And, and what do you do about that? That's, that's a real detriment. And one of the things that Margaret Sanger um, liked to say is that how can women have a voice in politics if they can't control their own body? How can they do anything with their lives if they can't control their own body? They can't have those decisions. And particularly, you know, we think having a few kids is, you know, I have three, it's, you know, three is okay. You can, you can handle three, but 16 kids, 18 kids, some of those huge numbers are just 
we're not designed to do that. That's really not healthy, and particularly when, when you don't have the medical advances and all of that. Um, and if that's what you want, that's different than not having alternatives. So um, this clinic opened up. They saw 500 people. One of the people they saw was a Comstock decoy. Um, so the Comstock decoy ended up um, bringing the information to Comstock and, and all those people. And surprise, surprise, Margaret Sanger, her sister, and the receptionist in the building were all arrested. Um, Margaret was pretty media savvy by this point, and she refused to get in the paddy wagon, and she walked the mile to the jail with the New York Times snapping pictures. And, you know, people piled up behind her, and all the women from the clinic walked behind. So there's hundreds of people now in the street walking her the mile to jail. She also, she was a tiny little redhead, five foot two woman, and these big burly police officers. So you can imagine what that looked like. I mean, think about it. They were obviously bullying her. And again, women were, women were delicate back then, and we protected them. And you know, women were innocent, and they never had bad intentions and, and all of that. So they, they walked her to jail. She wouldn't be fingerprinted, refused. And I just have pictures in my head of how this went, because you know, I watched you know, Orange is the New Black and all those shows. And she just, um, but she refused to be fingerprinted. Um, her sister went on trial first. Her sister was convicted to 30 days in the workhouse. Her sister was the first woman in the United States to engage in a sustained hun hunger strike. So she refused to eat. Well, guess what happened? Anybody? It's a good story. What do you think? Any guesses? No, she didn't die, but that's a, good, that's a bad guess, but a good guess. Uh, no, she didn't die. What ended up happening is front page New York Times, four days in a row. The update about her hunger strike, and oh my gosh, and everyone was freaking out because here's this poor delicate woman who's not eating. What are we going to do? We have to help her. We have to help her. Why is she in jail? Help her. So people started having a lot more questions about this whole like censoring birth control information. Why are we doing that? This, this woman is, you know, she's dying for, for the information, and, and you know, the, the prison officials are so mean to her. Eventually they force fed her. Um, but what's funny is soon after that, they, they pardoned her and released her early, and they just sent her home. Um, when it was Margaret's turn um, to go on trial about a month later, they, um, what, they, what the prosecution did, which was another horrible mistake on their part, they brought in a lot of the women who had been um, patients of the clinic. Now, they confiscated all the records when they did this. Now, if, nowadays with HIPAA, we're very aware of how important patient records are. Well, that kind of got the medical community a little up in arms because patient records were now all over the place and not protected. Um, the prosecution had these women get up and explain, you know, the fact that, yes, you know, she gave me birth control information and, yes, it's illegal, that sort of thing. Well, then the defense got up there and started asking, well, why? Why did you need the information? You know, what's your story? And you can just imagine how that affected everybody in the audience as well as the jury. Um, it affected everyone pretty dramatically. So soon enough, the prosecution stopped some of that. Um, another little side note to this particular story that's cute is originally the judge had um, requested a priest, a rabbi, and a minister to sit on the panel with him when he made this decision. Eventually, he decided that was not a good idea, but he had those people all lined up to help him make the moral decision on this particular case. Um, so the trial continues. Um, there's a committee of 100 um, formed, and this is 100 wealthy people who supported Margaret Sanger and, and provided money for her defense. And they had a, they had a dinner just the night before the trial. 3,000 people came to this. I mean, it was an enormous outswelling of support for her. Um, and as the trial progressed, it became more and more obvious that the prosecution was not going to win. So what ended up happening in the end is she was pardoned. She was basically released and set free because, well, no, actually she was convicted, but she was pardoned because they didn't want her in jail. <laughs> they didn't want her having a hunger strike. They didn't want any more publicity. They realized it's just not a good idea to go here anymore. We need to stop, like put it to bed, fine. You know, they, had, they did ask her to promise to stop disseminating birth control information. 
And she's like, well, I can't really do that. And like, well, that's fine. Just go anyway. Um, they, just, they just needed her out of, of the place. Um, now, I need to backtrack because there's one other story that I forgot because my PowerPoint didn't work. How's that? The dog ate my homework. Um, but there's one other story that is really important that kind of builds to this one, and that's the family limitation story. Now, if you remember, I mentioned earlier that Margaret Singer wrote this pamphlet and then she absconded to Europe. While she was gone, she asked her husband, and they were not on the best of terms most of the time, but she asked her husband to um, get in touch with people and disseminate this pamphlet all over the place. And they, they focused on um, union organizations and places where poor people were and that sort of thing. Anyway, as you can imagine, you know, the word gets out that this thing is being disseminated. Comstock sent a decoy, Comstock himself sent a decoy to the Sanger's apartment and had and told a sad story about, you know, woe is me, my wife, and, you know, I really need this information. So, so um, Margaret's husband sold a pamphlet to this person. Comstock himself was standing around the corner and came and arrested him. Like, just boom, arrested. Um, well, this turned out to be another mistake. Now, William Sanger was, he was supportive, but he was not passionate about birth control. Um, so, you know, and he was just doing what a good husband should do. Well, um, his arrest also generated a lot of publicity. People were disgusted by how this happened. They were disgusted by the entrapment. They were disgusted by, by just the entire process. William Sanger was not allowed to speak at his own trial, despite the fact that he wanted to. They, would not, they shut him up. The gallery was full of people who were supporting him because, you know, again, he's a socialist guy, and in New York at that time, there were a lot of, you know, so that whole community really bandied around him. Um, so they tried very hard to shut him up. Um, he had some excellent comment, comments about how Comstock broke the law in order to prosecute him for breaking the law, which, which really highlighted some of the hypocrisy that we saw in that particular case. Um, he, was, he was found guilty, of course, because he did it, and it was against the law. So he was found guilty and um, was to either pay a fine or go to jail. He, of course, chose to go to jail because you know, he felt principled in the whole matter. Um, but you start to see with each arrest the shift in perception, the shift in how people view birth control, the shift in our willingness to censor information and, and protect women and children from this, this content. Um, so Margaret Sanger, once the Brownsville Clinic thing, once she, once she finishes her court case and comes back, um, she still had some issues because of course her landlord pulled the lease which I guess makes sense given you know, the circumstances. I'm sure that's not what they thought was going to happen. So she ended up losing her lease. Um, she founded another birth control organization. And in 1921, she, um, she held the first national conference on birth control. By this point, Margaret Sanger had decided that the best way to address the law was to focus on medical professionals providing birth control information. That was her focus. So in this conference, she invited doctors and nurses and other medical professionals to kind of focus on providing this information. This was a difference between her and Mary Weir Dennett because Mary Weir Dennett was not a nurse, didn't pretend to be a nurse, and she felt like anybody who was a person should be able to talk about it, not just medical professionals. So you start to see this divide. So Margaret Sanger has this big conference, and guess who's not invited? like at all. And there was some back and forth kind of, because Mary Ware Dennett's vision is that we merge these birth control organizations together and partner. It, well, it does, but you should read the, the letters back and forth because it didn't make sense to Margaret Sanger. <laughs> it was like, no, I got this. We're totally good over here. You, you just do your little whatever thing over there. Um, and, and it did become quite a significant philosophical debate between these two groups. Um, Mary Ware Dennett was all about what was called the open bill, meaning that birth control information was no longer obscene, period, the end. Um, Margaret Sanger liked the restrictions. She thought the restrictions were okay. Medical professionals provide the information, everybody else shut up. That was, that was the divide between these two camps. Um, so funny story with this conference though. The last night of the conference, Margaret Sanger was supposed to speak um, 
And I think there were about 1,500 people in this auditorium to hear her speak. Well, the police got involved. And interestingly enough, the police got involved at the behest of the Archbishop of New York. And this is actually in the New York Times, like documented with the Archbishop saying, yeah, I'm the one who said they need to go and deal with this. I mean, so there, it is unequivocally clear that this was on the behest of, of the Catholic Church. So um, the police ended up locking the doors. Whoever was in had to stay in. Whoever was, was out couldn't get in. Um, and the claim that they made about why they had to do this is because there were children present. Um, now, being in a college, it's funny to, to hear who the children were. The children were four sociology students at Columbia University. Those were the kids. And they couldn't hear any of this information. They would be corrupted for life. So Margaret Sanger ended up not able to speak on that particular night, but that was another political win for her and her group. That got people really angry. And the more angry they got, the more people in society demanded this information. They expected to, to have this, and they didn't understand why it was so dangerous. The, and ironically enough, um, Harper's Magazine and a lot of the other um, mainstream publications started putting out articles about birth control, about the economic impacts and the social impacts and you know the medical considerations and all of that sort of thing. And the reason why it got picked up is because it was in the news so much. It became a current topic. So the law itself kind of undid the law and many of the things involved in the law. Um, the last side of the story that I want to get into today is Mary Ware Dunnett. Um, she was raising her two boys by herself by this point because her husband was with Mrs. Chase doing whatever they were doing. Um, so she was having a difficult time with these two young boys. How do you talk to them about sex? How do you talk to them about all that stuff? You know, it, particularly in this era where we didn't talk about it much to begin with and she, she was raising them on her own. So um, what she ended up doing is writing a pamphlet. Um, called The Sex Side of Life. And this pamphlet was, was very graphic with very detailed illustrations. Oh, I don't think I brought that book with, but um, very detailed illustrations, the kind of stuff you would see today if you looked in a, in a book that had information about you know, boy parts and girl parts and how everything worked. Um, so she, she put together this pamphlet and gave it to her kids. Um, she also published some additional copies for friends and, and other people who were, oh, yeah, I'm having that problem too. Oh, here. Um, Eventually got picked up by um, the New York or the the um, National Science Review. They asked if they could publish it in their newspaper, and from there she started publishing copies of it and selling it. Now she needed money, so of course that's a great thing for her. She sold them for like 25 cents each. She mailed them in just brown Manila envelopes. Um, what she started noticing with the clasp, and what she what started to happen is they started to discover that some of the envelopes were arriving at their destination empty. So they were pulling them. Like about 1922, they started to notice this. Um, in 1928, a Comstock decoy wrote requesting the information, sent it out to her. She ended up becoming, she was arrested for, um, uh, for violating the Comstock Act. Um, her case is really interesting because her case exploded in a way that would not have happened 10 years earlier. It just exploded. Um, and she wrote, well, she wrote two different books. Um, the first one is Birth Control Laws, Shall We Keep Them, Change Them, or Abolish Them? And then the second one she wrote, Who's Obscene? This was specifically dealing with the court case. This one dealt with all that information about why she was arrested. And, and she brought up some really good points. What's obscene and who gets to decide? And that's still an issue today. I mean, what's obscene? Is it what you think is obscene, or is it what I think is obscene? I don't know. It's a complicated issue. Um, I did look up some case law, some more recent case law, and it's still being decided. And a lot of it is based on um, contemporary perception. And when you think about, let's just, let's just take a moment and think about MTV and some of the things we see on TV and in the media now. Um, when I was a kid, you couldn't say any of the swear words on TV. Now you can. Um, you know. Lucy and Desi weren't allowed to sleep in the same bed. Now we, we see what looks to be real life 
action happening right there, it's a completely different standard. Our expectation, Elvis was in trouble for shape, shaking his paw, and look at what Miley did just a couple months ago. So our standards have shifted over time, um, and that's one of the things that she deals with in this book. But she also focused on the fact that if it's true, if it's factual, if this is the way our bodies work, why can't we talk about it? And is it obscene if it's really how things work? I mean, kind of an interesting um, question. Well, she ended up hooking up with the ACLU. She had been involved with them somewhat before, but ended up more directly involved with them. They, they created the Mary Weir Dennett um, Defense Fund, raised money for her, um, and she eventually ended up creating a, um, another branch of the ACLU that dealt with some issues related to this. Um, she ended up changing a lot. She was much more quiet and more genteel than Margaret Sanger. She was not so in your face. She didn't go out deliberately to violate the law. And interestingly enough, after she noticed some of her pamphlets were disappearing, she did contact the postal authorities to ask why. And well, what can I change? Which part is obscene? If there's just the part you don't like, I can modify. And they, could, they never would tell her. So she's like, well, if you can't tell me what's obscene, I'm going to keep sending it because I can't fix it if you don't tell me what's wrong. So she continued to send it over and over and over again. And even in the court case, they wouldn't, it just, it's obscene. Okay, well, which part is obscene? It's just bad. There was not a lot of detail about it. 